Thank you for joining with me. We are reading the Manual for Teachers. We are in part two, I'm sorry, part three, the function of the teacher of God. And we are in section five, how is healing accomplished? If you'd like to close your eyes and join me in prayer. Dear God, please enable me to set aside everything I think I know. Allow me to have an open mind and a new experience with all things. God, please give me your vision and help me to be who you would have me be. Go where you would have me go. Say what you would have me say and to whom. Thank you, God. I love you. Amen. The Function of the Teacher of God If the patient must change his mind in order to be healed, what does the teacher of God do? Can he change the patient's mind for him? Certainly not. For those already willing to change their minds, he has no function except to rejoice with them, for they have become teachers of God with him. He has, however, a more specific function for those who do not understand what healing is. These patients do not realize that that they have chosen sickness. On the contrary, they believe that sickness has chosen them. Nor are they open-minded on this point. The body tells them what to do and they obey. They have no idea how insane this concept is. If they even suspected it, they would be healed. Yet they suspect nothing. To them, the separation is quite real. To them, God's teachers come to represent another choice which they had forgotten. The simple presence of God's teachers is a reminder. Their thoughts ask for the right to question what the patient has accepted as true. As God's messengers, they are the symbols of salvation. They ask the patient for forgiveness for God's Son in His own name. They stand for the alternative. With God's word in their minds, they become, I'm sorry, they come in benediction, not to heal the sick, but to remind them of the remedy God has already given them. It is not their hands that heal. It is not their voice that speaks the word of God. They merely give what has been given them. Very gently they call to their brothers to turn away from death. Behold, you son of God, what life can offer you? Would you choose sickness in the place of this? We're going to pause there. Oh no, I'm going to read all the way because this is the last paragraph. Not once do the advanced teachers of God consider the forms of sickness in which their brother believes. To do this is to forget that all of them have the same purpose and therefore are not really different. They, and they refers to the teachers of God, seek for God's voice in this brother who would so deceive himself as to believe God's son can suffer. And they remind him that he has not made himself and must remain as God created him. They recognize illusions can have no effects. The truth in their minds reaches out to the truth in the minds of their brothers, so that illusions are not reinforced. They, and they refers to illusions, are thus brought to truth, and truth is not brought to them. So they are dispelled not by the will of another, but by the union of the one will with itself. Footnote 62. In other words, healing doesn't happen through the healer imposing an alien will on the patient. Rather, it happens through the healer's will, reaching out and uniting with the patient's will. This union of wills is possible because the two wills are not actually separate, but are two parts of the one will, God's will. Their union, therefore, is a union of the one will with itself. And this is the function of God's teachers, to see see no will as separate from their own, nor theirs as separate from God's. Thank you so much for joining with me. Tomorrow we will begin section six. 
And this was section five, how is healing accomplished? Part three, the function of the teacher of God. Thank you. Have a beautiful day. I appreciate your joining with me.